lecture series. Um, before I announce today's speaker, uh, a preview of next week's talk. Uh, on next Monday, it's the 9th, and we're going to have Professor Katerina Semendeshari from the UC San Diego Department of Anthropology. Uh, her talk will be entitled Neuroanatomical Perspectives on the Evolution of Mind. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Steve Newberg from Arizona State University, Department of Psychology. And Steve is going to be talking to us today uh, about a functional affordance centered model of person perception, prejudices, and social interaction, taking into account life history and ecological considerations. I apologize for the title. Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me. This is a this is really a, uh, a fun thing for me. I just want to start off with this little uh, this this little piece, this little written by uh, Kafka, which Gibson quoted, uh, which then uh, MacArthur and Barron quoted, which is where I discovered it back in my very first semester of graduate school in, in 1983, on a paper they wrote about uh, a peak logical approach uh, to uh, person perception, uh, sort of building off of uh, James Gibson's, uh, of his ideas he was uh, working, uh, developing about vision. I love this quote. I, at the time, I actually very much disliked the paper. Uh, so, so, go tell us. I mean, that's a uh, big mistake by a brand new graduate student. Food says, eat me, water says, drink me, thunder says, fear me, and woman says, love me. The idea here has to do uh, with affordance, that there are things out there in the world that afford certain value uh, for us. As I was thinking this morning about this talk, I was thinking about the affordance value that you guys are providing for me uh, uh, right now. And I like to think about affordances in terms of threats and opportunities, and uh, from uh, you know, talking to one of one of the great things about being here is 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 is, is how multidisciplinary uh, this group happens to be, and uh, and that provides its own kinds of uh, challenges uh, in terms of thinking about talk. And I've been I've been playing with this for around the last three days, and I've had conversations with Dan and some other folks yesterday. And I'm throwing stuff out, and I'm putting stuff back in, and uh, restructuring the whole thing uh, because I want to be able to take fullest advantage of the opportunities that you guys uh, pose. And, and especially towards the end of the talk today, I'm going to be moving into territory uh, that are very much a novice in, and I'm very much looking forward to your, to your feedback uh, on some of those ideas uh, that I'm starting to play with. <clears throat> Just to give a real quick overview, uh, I think about person perception as affordance management. In fact, I think about all behavior as affordance uh, as affordance management, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what I mean uh, by that. Whoops, that was not the right thing to click. Okay. What I'm going to uh, spend a good chunk of my time, most of the time today, talking about is sort of applying an affordance management view to be thinking about uh, intergroup uh, relations, uh, uh, social categorization, and the idea of prejudice. Uh, in particular, what the implications of an affordance management kind of approach to be thinking about prejudice, uh, what those implications are, and I think they're actually, uh, I, th I think they're extremely uh, important. Uh, in, the in, the, in the process of doing some of that work, uh, some interesting uh, little anomalies popped up and important questions uh, came to mind, which brings me to a conclusion that suggests that when we think about uh, social categorization schemes, we think about in-group, out-group as being sort of one general broad way of, uh, of categorizing folks and coming to understand other people, uh, that, that that may be problematic in certain kind of ways, at least in the, in the simple kind of ways that, that, that uh, folks in most uh, social and behavioral sciences think about that. So we spend some time talking about that. And some of my thinking brought me to the point of wondering whether what behavioral ecologists think about when they're thinking about life history may, in fact, be useful for helping me solve some of the problems of understanding uh, how it is that we uh, uh, we think about uh, think about and out So that's uh, that's sort of a gross overview. All right, uh, person perception is affordance management. Uh, we don't really need to talk about this here, but 
ultimate goal of reproductive fitness, but you know, uh, it's not all just about having sex. That is, in order to, in order to move towards uh, reproductive, enhanced reproductive fitness, we have a set of more, uh, what you might think about as penultimate or fundamental motives. Uh, my colleagues, Doug Henrich and, and I, and we've actually been doing some recent work with Mark Schaller and, and Vlad Grishkevichis, on thinking about what these, what these uh, fundamental motives might be, and in fact, how many they may be related to each other. Some of you here uh, uh, from psychology or who knows, know about Maslow's uh, sort of needs hierarchy, we've recently been thinking about how one might reconceptualize a needs hier hierarchy from a functional perspective, a developmental perspective, and, uh, and, a, and a more sort of uh, immediate, proximate uh, information processing and uh, kind of perspective as well. Uh, and in general, uh, the idea is, you know, I'm not going to really go into this, but you can think about these, uh, these more fundamental motives. Motives having to do with self-protection uh, and disease avoidance, having to do with a social affiliation, uh, status, getting esteem from other folks, mate acquisition, mate retention, and, and parenting. As, uh, as sort of fundamental uh, life tasks, domains of tasks, uh, goals that, uh, uh, that, that humans have uh, in the, in the, with a larger aim of enhancing uh, reproductive fitness. Okay, well, we're sexually reproducing critters and we're also highly interdependent uh, ultra-social animals. And so our ability to sort of achieve those goals really depends uh, to a great extent on the actions of other folks. Uh, and what that means is that we need to manage other's actions such that they enhance rather than hinder our movement towards other All right, well, how do you manage uh, other people's actions such that they uh, facilitate your goals. We need to have a good enough understanding of that, and in particular, you need to have a good enough understanding of what their own goals are. Uh, in particular, the behavioral strategies that they're likely to use to uh, uh, to implement their own goals, to move towards their own goals, uh, and their ability to implement those strategies, because those strategies, their actions in the in the service of uh, moving towards their own goals, impinge upon us and our ability to manage our own. So. In some sense, what we're thinking about from, from this perspective, when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm looking out and I'm seeing strangers or I'm interacting with folks, is that what I'm really doing is I'm assessing their affordance value for me, right? Uh, what, what behaviors are they likely to engage in that's gonna, that's gonna impact my ability to, uh, to reach my particular goals? And in particular, when we're talking about affordance value, we're thinking about uh, the threats they potentially pose and the opportunities that they potentially pose, okay. Uh, this isn't such an easy thing, right? And so in, uh, we, we rarely are able to actually perceive others' goals, their intentions, uh, and their capacities. And oftentimes when we can sort of use the word directly loosely, we can directly perceive them, it's too late, as when uh, a big stick is headed right towards your forehead or something of that sort. Uh, it's difficult to anticipate the way people are, or the strategies people are going to use in order to implement their goals because there are multiple ways of, of implementing a lot of goals. Right? So if you want to gain status, you can gain status by being violent. You can gain status by, uh, by creating certain kind of friendships or by doing favors for folks. You can gain status by investing long term in your own education. Uh, there are a lot of ways of achieving status. Uh, those different strategies for achieving status, different strategies are, are going to impinge differently, have different implications for me. They have different affordance value for me as I want to uh, pursue my own goals. And so we're, we're stuck in this position of, of, of trying to guess at these states and infer uh, from people's behaviors and characteristics, uh, those characteristics and behaviors that are perceptually salient and uh, heuristically linked to actual goals and strategies. So for example, uh, if you think about threats to, uh, to physical safety, there may be some characteristics that are cues out there that are available, things having to do with muscle mass, things having to do with facial expressions, angry expressions, for example. Uh, maybe a decent kind of cue, but often we don't have uh, access to those kinds of pieces of information. Uh, others, because like us, they're motivated to manage our actions so they can facilitate their own goals, are often motivated to disguise or fake the cues that we might use to infer what their, what their strategies are likely to be, what their goals are. And so what would really be useful for us is to have information that's uh, heuristically available or that's provided by invariant or relatively invariant cues, cues that are more difficult to disguise, difficult to fake. So to the extent that, we can, that there are cues out there that are stable, but they're not easily manipulated by the person who's, who's exhibiting those cues, 
That's going to be information that's going to be particularly useful for us. Uh, I'm going to call these mega queues. I don't know why I'm calling them mega queues. Maybe there's a better name for them. If anyone has a better name for them, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd be really happy to entertain them. But you might think about a mega queue as being an invariant or, or a near invariant queue that's perceptually accessible, right? You need to be able to access it and access it relatively quickly and easily. And in particular, a queue that implies complexes of affordance relevant information, not just one little piece of information, but maybe information that says a lot about what kinds of uh, affordances this person uh, 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 brings to you. Uh, that those kind of queues will be especially useful, and that these kind of queues will, will essentially serve as fundamental social categories. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few of them today here, too, that I'm not going to talk about today unless the questioning sort of brings us there. Uh, one, uh, you might think about morphological abnormality, right? So uh, individuals who uh, are abnormal in certain kinds of ways, uh, asymmetry, uh, uh, missing limbs, uh, uh, different, kinds of, uh, different kinds of physical characteristics, they're sort of invariant, but they don't, they, don't, they don't change a lot. Right? That would be different than, say, someone who's sneezing. Right? Uh, that's, that's clearly important information and very useful information to have, but that's sort of not a mega queue in, in the same kind of way. Well, <coughs> these kind of abnormalities, they carry heuristically, and by, by heuristically, I mean probabilistically, uh, valuable information, for example, uh, regarding disease transmission, genetic quality, ability to perform certain kind of tasks, the likelihood that maybe these people would be dependent, uh, on me, like we a free ride on, on me because of those dependencies and things of that sort. Uh, we, we can go into this more later if uh, My thing about kinship uh, related cues and uh, is also carrying characteristically uh, valuable information uh, regarding people's willingness to invest in you, your obligation to invest in them as a cost, eligibility as a mate. Right? Typically the answer to that is eh, probably not. Uh, and, and the like, right? So, so here, here, here are two classes uh, of uh, uh, sort of mega queues that are, that are useful for social categorization. We obviously see people using these a lot. And in fact, I think they do. What I'm going to be focusing on today, actually the two others I'm going to be focusing on, were things that look like two others but are really one other. I'll be focusing on a little later, but for now, uh, I want to talk about this idea of, of outgroupness. I'm going to be, I'm going to be a little loose here about coalitional versus cultural. I had a long conversation with, uh, uh, with, with, with Dan the other day. Uh, and, and people from different disciplines seem to use these words a little differently. I tend to be thinking about coalitional, uh, coalitional groups, my coalition, other coalitions. Uh, I, I think yesterday, uh, Christina used the word ethnic to refer to something that might be more similar to what you were talking about, <coughs> cultural, uh, sort, of, you know, sort of a cultural groups. Uh, and maybe those are, those are larger groups, you're not necessarily acting coalitionally with them at any time, but maybe they're sort of coalitions in waiting or something. But for our, I think for my purposes now, those kind of distinctions aren't going to be all that important. But the idea of someone being a member of a, of a meaningful outgroup, well, that carries uh, uh, heuristically valuable information as well. For example, regarding the likely trustworthiness of that person towards you, they're not invested in you, they don't have a history with you. Uh, the likelihood that exchanges are going to be fair, uh, the ability to socially coordinate uh, with them, the extent to which they may pose physical <coughs> dangers for you. Again, they're not invested in you and their welfare. Uh, they may want stuff that you, that, that you have. Likelihood of disease because they may be carrying different kind of pathogens than the ones that typically are populating your own body and, and the like. Uh, this in-group, out-group kind of uh, distinction is really seen as a key construct in, uh, in, in most of the social and behavioral uh, sciences. Uh, different disciplines. And in my field, social psychology, it's really been one of the focal challenges. Uh, I mean, people have been doing research on, on in-group, out-group relations since the, you know, really focused research since the 1930s. Uh, and, uh, and, and scattered research before that as well. And if you, you know, if you look in social psych journals, uh, probably around a third of anything in there has to do with in-group, uh, out-group relations. Out of all the things in social behavior, it's a, it's a very important. Well, I'm not sure that this in-group, out-group distinction is nearly as useful for understanding people's social behavior, perhaps, as we've been thinking all along. At least thinking about the in-group, uh, out-group distinction as most researchers conceptualize it. And, and, and you'll see what I mean by that uh, as we move along. Okay. In particular, thinking in terms of affordance value, I think forces us to go beyond thinking about in-group, out-group. Uh, and that this has really critical implications for understanding prejudice and discrimination. So I'm going to spend a, some time talking about some of the data that we have 
samples of data we have about this, and, and, and just to show the usefulness of an affordance kind of approach for, for better understanding prejudice. Uh, well, sort of an underlying assumption, I'm not sure anyone actually, any particular approach said this <coughs> explicitly, but an underlying assumption of sort of the traditional ways of thinking about in-group, out-group, is that out-groups are sort of out-groups, out-groups. We're thinking about the in-group, and then there are out-groups out there. Uh, and from, but from my perspective, what that would mean to say that outgroups are outgroups would be to say that they afford us similar threats and similar opportunities, right? Because from what I'm interested in, I'm interested in how someone else's actions uh, are going to impinge upon me and therefore, therefore my ability to sort of effectively pursue my own goals. Uh, well, different outgroups potentially pose qualitatively distinct threats and opportunities. Different th threats and opportunities of members. Okay, that's one of the late night kind of things that didn't get fixed in, uh, in editing. Uh, different outcomes, but they potentially pose qualitatively distinct threats and opportunities, and we want to know this uh, because different threats and opportunities require different responses from us, right? Someone who may be threatening my physical health via disease, my response to that person is going to be very different than someone uh, who's taking something from me versus someone who's, uh, uh, who's potentially attacking me and the like. It's not just good enough to say this person's an outgroup member from an affordance perspective. It's important to know exactly what the threats and opportunities are that, that, that folks are, are pursuing. All right, so prejudice is an affect, uh, as, as typically conceptualized. It's typically defined as, as, uh, as an attitude, typically a negative attitude, uh, negative valence, negative feelings uh, towards a group or towards that group's members. Okay. Uh, well, I'm not a big fan of thinking in terms of uh, affect, in terms of balance, sort of good, bad, positive, negative. Uh, I think a functional approach to be thinking about affect, I had an interesting conversation with Matt, and maybe we'll follow up on this uh, later, that a functional approach really needs to be thinking in, in more specific kind of ways. And I much prefer thinking about affect in terms of emotions, uh, fear, disgust, anger, sadness. Uh, emotions are functional. They interrupt ongoing activities uh, and draw attention to specific goals when these goals have been jeopardized. So you may be walking down the street thinking about you know, going and meeting a friend for coffee and all of a sudden here comes a truck barreling down at you and one of the things that happens is that your emotional system sort of kicks in and you're not thinking about this uh, time you're spending with a friend, you're not thinking about something else. Uh, right? so, so emotions serve this interrupting uh, kind of function and reorienting and they also facilitate the activation of functionally uh, appropriate responses. And the physiology of emotions are likely to lead to these kind of responses versus those kind of responses uh, and the like. The really important thing to be thinking about in terms of emotions is that different emotional alarms uh, sound in response to different threats. They energize distinct syndromes of cognitions, motivations, and action tendencies. So, uh, you perceive physical danger and what you experience is what we call fear. And fear energizes escape, sometimes under circumstances where you can't escape, fight uh, as well, but, but typically uh, it energizes attempts, uh, attempts to escape. In contrast, we confront something we perceive as being an obstacle to a goal, a taking of something of value uh, from us, for example. Uh, you feel angry. You don't feel afraid unless the taker is right there and, and also uh, is threatening us in some kind of way, but we feel angry, and that, that anger uh, tends to facilitate aggressive uh, action tendencies. We see something as contaminating, we experience disgust, uh, and that leads to avoidance, rejection. Uh, we, and we can think about uh, people have done interesting research on both physical contamination, pathogen kind of contamination, as well as moral contamination. And sometimes we can actually differentiate moral and physical disgust. But the idea here, again, is that you've got very different kind of responses to different kinds of threats, and emotions are mediating those responses. The other thing here to point out is that if you're thinking about negative affect, fear, anger, and disgust are all negative, right? They'd all be classified as negative. And yet, the experience of them is very different the display is very different. The behaviors that, that, that are consequential to them are very different as well. Thinking about negativity and positivity uh, just isn't, isn't, uh, isn't all that useful. Uh, all right, so now we come back to this idea of thinking about in groups, out groups. Well, to the extent that different groups are perceived to pose different threats, what this framework would say is that they should elicit different emotions. While the traditional con conception of uh, prejudice is as a generalized attitude, simple valence. Uh, 
And that's therefore problematic, right? Uh, from, the, from the affordance perspective, from the distinct emotions perspective, uh, instead of a prejudice, <laughs> negativity, right, there should be multiple qualitatively distinct prejudices, right? So I should have different prejudices towards folks, groups of folks, who I see as being physically dangerous, and those that I see as being diseased, and those I see as being, as being taking, taking things from me, say. Right? This general notion of, of just negativity uh, doesn't, doesn't really buy much uh, from a functional perspective. All right. uh, and this is, this is a little bit more of a methodological uh, point right here, is that uh, if so, then tr one of the problems we may have and why the fields haven't really discovered the specificity is that they've got these sort of general measures of, uh, of, of negative affect, but they may in fact mask qualitative differences between prejudice. And I'll give you just a couple of illustrations out of a whole bunch I could. So I'm just gonna, we, we've, got, we've got tons of data, I'm just gonna pop this one up because this is the easiest one for you guys to, to access if you, if you get interested. This is work with uh, Kathy Cottrell, uh, Janessa Shapiro, who's over uh, in the psych department, has also done some, uh, some of this work with me too. Uh, European American students, uh, uh, very simple. We give them a survey and we, uh, we ask them to report their perceptions of the threats posed to American society. We've also done this uh, threat posed to people like me. Same kind of pattern, same kind of underlying uh, uh, psychology. And in this case, we've got nine different groups and we ask about the feelings towards their groups. Uh, I'll expand on how other data go beyond that. In this particular case, uh, uh, these nine groups, African Americans, Asian Americans, Native Americans, Mexican Americans, activists, feminists, Gay men, fundamentalist Christians, European Americans, and non-fundamentalist Christians. Our subjects here, again, for this particular study are, are European Americans. We measure a whole range of threats, including a sort of general notion of threat, but also safety, res economic resources, health values, reciprocity. Uh, where these threats come from, I'm not going to talk about this today, but they come from a perspective in which uh, when you think about what sort of the near necessary characteristics of effective groups might be, what is it that groups really need, characteristics groups need to have in order to be effective for their, for their members? From that, you can, uh, you can draw some inferences about the kinds of things that would threaten the effectiveness of groups. And so uh, we could go into this at some point, but that's sort of where we generated uh, uh, these different kinds of threats. Uh, and we measured uh, a range of, uh, of feelings as well. Uh, general, general prejudice, general affect, as well as uh, specific uh, emotions. And I'm not going to talk about all of them here. Okay. Uh, well, the first idea related to this affordance notion that, uh, uh, that you can't just think in terms of in-group, out-group is that we would expect different, different groups, different out-groups for our subjects uh, to perceive different patterns of, uh, of threat emanating from these, from these other groups. And again, as a methodological point, just thinking about threat in general, why that would be inadequate as a way of, of, of thinking about in-group, out-group. So here's just one example. Uh, I mean, I, I could throw tons of that. I'm throwing this one, this one prickled out because the equality on general threat is just so sort of nice and perfect. So it makes for a nice picture. Uh, but but you, you have to trust me on this. Uh, we, if we find these patterns, we'll find. So here's just looking at two different groups: African American and fundamentalist Christians. Again, these are Euro American, uh, Euro American subjects. If we ask them, and, and all these uh, numbers, by the way, this is sort of subtracting out their views towards their own group. Doesn't make a difference uh, analysis-wise, but it's more. It's just easier to put them all on sort of on a on a scale. People use people report different kind of threats at different sort of magnitudes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, what do they? What, what do our uh, Euro-American uh, subjects see here? They see African Americans as posing a greater threat to property and to safety, and they pose fundamentalist Christians as posing a uh, uh, greater threat to uh, to values. Right. And so here we've got this idea, and all the simple point I just want to make right here is just that. Uh, different groups are seen to pose very different threats, and that may exist even when the groups are seen as equally threatening in general. Okay, that's that's the only point I want to make right here. Oops, why do I keep doing that? Oops. Uh, all right. Well, if different if groups pose different kind of threats, they should also elicit uh, different profiles of emotions, and uh, and that these differences again, the argument I'm making likely are being masked by, uh, by traditional measures of prejudice. And so here's just another example uh, from the same data set. Uh, prejudice is the same between, this is gay men and Mexican Americans. Again, I selected them just because uh, this, is, this is nice and close and makes for a nice picture. Uh, but again, we have this all over the place across something like 50 groups that we've studied over, over, over the years now. 
uh, well, we see relatively the same amounts of anger that our Euro-American uh, subjects uh, uh, have elicited by these two groups, but gay men are eliciting uh, a lot more disgust, uh, and Mexican-Americans are eliciting a lot more fear. Uh, right? So again, different, different affective patterns, different emotion patterns uh, for groups that nonetheless are people report being similarly prejudiced towards. The specificity is important. All right. Tons of examples of, of this, of, of qualitatively different threat and emotion profiles for different groups. Uh, the idea here, one well, of the biggest, is that different groups have different affordance values. And, uh, and we'll, we'll come back to what, what that really means in a broader theoretical way. Uh, numerous examples of this differentiation being masked by gross measures of threat and prejudice. Uh, this is really important. So this is a functional perspective, right? So the idea here is that threats should be leading to emotions, which then should be leading towards behaviors, right? Because the behavior is what you do. That's how you deal with the threat, right? So the behavior is really important. Well, so it turns out that uh, our emotion profiles are beautifully predicted by our threat profiles in an exact sort of functional analysis, exact way you'd expect based on what sort of theories of emotions and, and the like. Uh, it's too complicated to present all those data here, and I want to move on. Uh, Behavioral, this is, from a different, this is from a different study. If you look at profiles of behavioral inclinations, right? so we ask people about things like uh, ranging from sort of policy preferences they have, but whether they want uh, more police on the street, whether they keep the lights on at night, whether they wash their hands after shaking hands with a, with a gay man, whether, I mean, all sorts of kind of things where you've got behaviors that seem to be functionally related to the threat as perceived. Uh, with gay man, the, the threat there being uh, being a disease threat, which 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 gets which pops in uh, in folks' heads. Uh, the profiles of these behavioral inclinations are predicted beautifully by the uh, threat profile, mediated by the emotion profile. So what we have here is this logic, right? Perceived threat, certain patterns of emotions that are functionally relevant to the extent that they're actually driving behavioral inclinations. Controlling for threat perceptions, there's almost no remaining impact of groups on, on emotions, right, on, 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 on the pre prejudices, right? This is sort of interesting, right? From this perspective, so if, 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 you, if you run these uh, regression analyses and you try to predict uh, independently the ability of the threats to predict the emotions versus, uh, versus the different groups themselves to predict, once you pull out threats, there's, there's nothing left. There's nothing left. And it's, of course, it's asymmetrical, right? So uh, groups, the effect of groups, when you look at it in a zero-order way, entirely disappears when you think about threats. It's almost as if groups, the labels we have for these other groups, are really sort of carriers for these affordances that the individual members or the groups on the whole are seen to pose to you. There's nothing really special about groups, per se. Uh, this also has, this, 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 we can talk about this today unless it comes up later, we can talk about it. Uh, but this view has important implications for reducing prejudices, particularly in terms of how interventions need to be functionally specific, and uh, contrast to a lot of uh, sort of uh, anti-prejudice interventions that are out there. Okay, so, so the big picture, the big point I want you to take away from this right now is that coalitional or cultural outgroupness as a simple categorization isn't explaining these data, right? We've got all this texture in the data that go well beyond thinking about in group. All right, so what we're doing a good job of across a lot of data now is going from threats to emotions to behavior, and it follows a beautiful sort of functional argument. What we don't have is an explanation for where the threats are coming from. That is, why are some groups seen as threatening in certain kind of ways, and other groups seen as threatening in other kind of ways? Uh, we, we, could, we could posit mechanisms having to do with personal experiences with groups, or uh, social transmission, watching TV, learning from folks, learning from uh, peers, and in an approximate way, yes, I'm sure these things uh, have influences, important influences. Uh, I'm intrigued by the possibility of sort of going a little deeper into the question. And so we have some data on, on a couple social structural factors that one might think about. Uh, we, we ran a study, uh, we've actually had two studies. We have, the other thing I didn't mention is that you know, those data that I showed you are, are sort of college undergrads. We've actually replicated the fundamentals of those patterns uh, in a representative national sample of uh, African Americans, Asian Americans, and, and Euro Americans as well. And, and we see this, we get, uh, people, are, people are using this stuff now all over the world and they're finding very, very similar kind of, the underlying structure a threat to emotion to behavior seems to be very solid, even though the particular threats that certain groups are seen to pose may differ in, in localities. 
Uh, we ran some studies in which we had multiple groups, uh, 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 Hispanic Americans, Euro Americans, and African Americans evaluate one another and Asian Americans. We just didn't get the N up high enough on Asian Americans where we, we ran this down in, uh, in Florida. And, that, and so they're all judging their own group. They're all judging each of the other groups. Uh, and so what you, what you have there is you have a little bit of a sense of sort of this inter-ethnic matrix, right? I mean, typically, you know, social psychology uh, sort of thinks about, you know, most of the data are about majority whites evaluating minority groups, typically minority blacks, right? Very little data going the other direction. Certainly not thinking about all these different groups. But you can think about if you had a simple in-group, out-group explanation, you might think that, that whites would have the pretty much the same kind of feelings, the same kind of perceptions of all the three outgroups, and that blacks would have the same kind of feelings toward, towards all three of those uh, of the other outgroups and the like. You can also generate structural uh, hypotheses having to do with relative status. So you know, uh, Euros and Asians are uh, are viewed as being higher status than uh, uh, Hispanic uh, Hispanic Americans and African Americans. Right? And so you might think that that particular division would, would, would carry a lot of weight in terms of predicting, uh, uh, predicting affect and behavioral information. Or you can think about majority-minority distinction, where the minority groups would sort of view each other similar to each other and different than the majority, and the majority would view the three minority groups as whatever. You can, you can sort of play these structural analyses against each other. Uh, I'm not going to present these data here, uh, but what we find is that the threat perspective, where you just look at the particular threats that each group sees the other groups as posing, Predicting uh, is predicting emotions data. Almost nothing uh, being driven by these uh, other these other social structural factors. Uh, in fact, in some 56 different tests, looking at the different emotions and different uh, behaviors that we've measured, in none of the 56 tests have have the structural models uh, 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 come even close to uh, to the predictive validity of the, of the threat model. Okay. So those are those are social structural kind of things. Things having to do with an ecology of sorts. Uh, that, that aren't uh, explaining where the threats are coming. And in fact, they don't predict the threats uh, uh, either uh, in any coherent way that then allows uh, future inference about emotions and, and behaviors. Uh, but I'm going to come back to the ecology idea later. All right. Here's another. So that, so that, that was one sort of challenge. Where do the threats come from? Right? That's, why, so that's one question that needs to be answered. Here's another challenge. Uh, and that is when you look within a particular outgroup, so not just the cross outgroup, look within a particular outgroup, you get uh, you get nuanced responses there as well. Uh, so it turns out, so so we we did a sort of a, a quick and dirty st uh, study. Uh, we're we're replicating in a much more systematic kind of way now. Uh, where we're just looking at whites' views of, uh, of, of African-American subgroups. So uh, black teenage men, uh, uh, black female teenagers, toddlers, grandmothers, professionals. Uh, and it turns out that those groups differ wildly in how people view the threats, uh, the threats and opportunities that those folks pose and in the emotional reactions to them, right? So even when you're thinking within a group, you don't have a homogeneity of, of affordance value across the subgroups. You get wild different differentiation. In, in particular, uh, young outgroup uh, men uh, are psychologically uh, psychologically prominent in terms of the safety threat. Now we can play with different kind of threats, and you expect different subgroups to have different effects. And so I don't, I'm not making claims about about uh, one group and all the threats and all the opportunities and the like. Just, just making the point here is that when you're, when you're thinking about the affordance value, you, you, even thinking within a th one particular outgroup, you get a lot of variation. Uh, and, and what's interesting about this particular variation is that it, it has to do with young outgroup men. Uh, and, and there are other conceptualizations out there, Jim Sedanius, uh, Carlos Navarrete, and other folks have been finding uh, those kind of things. In fact, if you look at the social psychological literature, you look at all the experimental findings on things like outgroup homogeneity. And, uh, and, and, and rapid processing of, 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 of weapons versus wallets and, and hands, right, and, and the kind of errors that people make. It turns out that just about all these studies that are, that are showing uh, these kind of uh, race-based biases turn out for stimuli to be using young black men versus young, uh, young white men. Uh, I think either, either by intuition or by experience, it doesn't end up showing up in the research and the methods sections of articles, 
uh, there's a sense that this is this is a this is a very psychologically prominent group for for typical uh, uh, white perceivers. Now it turns out that you don't get the same findings for all young men of different out groups. So you don't find the same things for for Asian men. Maybe later we can talk about some some data there. Uh, so. The in-group, out-group thing, even though the affordance thing has been very valuable in terms of, uh, in terms of thinking about uh, threats and its ability to predict emotions, uh, we need conceptual tools to bring us a little bit beyond that. Uh, the threat affordances aren't distributed uniformly across subtypes, psychological prominence of young men. Young men from different groups are perceived to afford the same threats, and we need something that helps us understand that as well. All right. So, so, so this, this is where uh, this is where I hope you guys help me a lot. Uh, as I was thinking about this, and particularly thinking about this idea of young outgroup men and why they're so psychologically prominent, uh, I started thinking about sex times age categorizations, right? Young men, and uh, I'm admittedly have a, an impoverished understanding of life history theory, but my understanding of life history theory is that an awful lot of uh, importance is placed on gender by age, the, what, the, what the life tasks are of folks, primarily as a function of their gender and age, and as they're moving on through, and in fact, in, in, in terms of how this relates to whatever the local ecologies are. So what I'm, what I'm gonna suggest here today, and maybe I'm right, maybe I'm not, is that the sex size age categorizations in terms, of, uh, in terms of sort of affordance calculation, well, tells us something about what others' goals and capacities are. You throw ecology into that, what the local ecology is, and that tells us something about the specific strategies that folks may use to, uh, to, to, to pursue those particular goals that are generated primarily by sex and age. So those, those are the ideas that I'm going to throw out here today, and we'll see what you think. All right. Uh, sex times age is a fundamental social categorization. Now, the social psychology, we've been, I mean, so back when I was in graduate school and, and writing about uh, stereotyping and social categorization and the like, we sort of had a big three of social categories. And it was, uh, it was sort of ethnicity slash race slash, slash nationality, that sort of outgroupness kind of thing. Uh, we, had, uh, we had gender and we had age. And then there's a fourth that some people were talking about, uh, which is interesting in light of some of the conversations yesterday, uh, occupation. Uh, that, that, that sometimes might, in fact, serve as a similar kind of uh, sort of fundamental uh, grounds for, for useful social, social categorization. Well, there wasn't much of a, of a, I mean, besides the fact that, you know, sex and age are really sort of obvious and perceptually available, there wasn't a whole lot of good theorizing about why, in fact, these might be really important. But from a life history approach, to me, it's obvious why, why, why sex by age together uh, should be a fundamental way people categorize others, because together they actually influence people's goal hierarchies, what goals are important to them at a time, and what they're investing their own, uh, uh, their own efforts into, whether it be status seeking or mating or parenting, whatever. So if, that's what they're, if, if sex times age is actually influencing people's goals, then it should be a particularly information-rich way to categorize others. Uh, the other thing I want to just mention real quickly is that I'm, I'm thinking about this as sex times age together, as opposed to independent categorizations. I'm actually not so sure anymore, the more I've been thinking about this lately, that, uh, that people actually ever make sex, except in the absence of, uh, of, except in the case of really impoverished information, really actually ever make sex, do, really do sort of sex stereotyping, sex prejudice, Thinking about prejudice in terms of sex and gender is, is a little bit problematic, or age stuff by itself. Uh, maybe a little bit more for age, but certainly I don't think I don't think for gender that, that really, if you really want to understand uh, someone, you really see the two of them together. Uh, and I think from a from a social, from a social psychological perspective, that that's that, that's sort of that's a, that's a that's a novel concept. That's not, that may not be novel to you guys at all. Uh, those of you who are behavioral ecologists. Okay. Well, one thing, one, one way to start uh, pursuing this idea, and we've just started, I've, I just got some master's data the other day from a, from a student who's working on sort of a, a subset of this, uh, is to ask the question whether people actually believe uh, that the psycho psychological prominence of others' fundamental goals changes as a function of their sex and their age, <coughs> right? So if, it, if they don't, right, so if people aren't really thinking that other people's goals change, uh, 
as, uh, as, as a function of their sex and age, well, then maybe there's not much grounds for this actually being sort of a useful way of, uh, of inferring uh, their affordance value. Okay, so here's a very preliminary study, some early findings. Uh, unfortunately, as I try to, to lift the figures into my PowerPoint, uh, I'm not very good at this stuff, and I couldn't get them in. So I, I gave you some conclusions uh, from some of the things, but uh, I can't give you these very nice pictures that we have. Male and female students uh, reported how concerned, how concerned important, uh, how concerned people are with how important it is uh, uh, for males and females of different ages. So ranging from two to 75, and we had some reasons for picking those uh, particular ages, uh, to, to pursue just two goals, form friendships and gain status. Now, they're not necessarily the two that I would pick, but, but my student has certain interests and, and, and he's pursuing those things. And in terms of the broader, I think, I think the, the claim that I'd be making would be even stronger if we had picked a couple of these other goals, but this is, this is sort of a good start. And what we find, uh, for instance, uh, give you sort of a simple, sort of straightforward thing in some of the text afterwards, that the, there's an increase in perceived concern that as people see others as being more concerned, more motivated, more driven, more interested, in making new friends and gaining status up until around age 25. Now, when I say age 25, the previous thing is, is 18. So that means they're sort of, that they're sort of driving up there. And sort of after 25, before they had, I think, 31, it starts going down a little bit. So you see this thing going up, and then it starts coming down. Well, in terms of thinking about making friends, you see a huge jump between two and eight, right? At that point, you know, there, there's, there's at least the theory that our, people, that, that our subjects have, participants have, that making friends becomes a really important goal around there. Uh, to date, you get, you get a big thing, and then at a later age, between 8 and 18, status starts to become. Okay, well that's something that, that one might think about in sort of a, a life history kind of way, where sort of different kind of goals are becoming different, differentially prominent uh, at, uh, at different ages. Uh, and then we start seeing some sex differences here as well. I think the sex differences are particularly much greater if we're looking at some of the other goals in these two. Uh, from 8 on uh, until 85, women are perceived as being more interested than men in making friends. Uh, from 25 on, uh, men are perceived as more interested than women in, in gaining status. And, uh, and you guys who know the anthropology of this might know how well those particular perceptions. So when it really says from, uh, from 25 on, it really could be anywhere from after 18 uh, on, given, given the, because we don't have a perfectly continuous scale that we have them responding to. Uh, about, about how well this actually represents sex differences in, uh, uh, in different kind of goals that, that folks actually have out there. All right, I don't want to reify the particulars of these numbers and these whatever, uh, but the main point here is that this, this is preliminary evidence and we're now in the process of, of gathering across a wider range of goals, uh, preliminary evidence that people have beliefs about others' goal trajectories across the lifespan and that these trajectories in fact differ by sex by age. Okay. All right. Related findings from another uh, preliminary study. This is this is actually the the, the study uh, where we looked at the different sub sort of the different subtypes of African Americans and Euro Americans, uh, different sort of sex by age combos. Uh, age by sex predicts white threat perceptions of the whites. So if you think about the group, the, the subgroup that's seen as being most threatening uh, in terms of safety in this case uh, towards whites, it's young men. Right, so it's, it's 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 young men. And in fact, if you look at the overall pattern of uh, of their of the theory that our white subjects have of the different dangerousness of uh, of, uh, of of African Americans along these different age dissect groups and euros, it's the same pattern. In fact, uh, you know the 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 age by sex combination in terms of predicting threat carries so much more of the variance than in fact the in group out group status does. In fact, the only place. Uh, <laughs> Do I have that here? Yeah. So the only place actually where we see any kind of anti-black black, uh, uh, threat perception, and in this case fear as the as the emotion, uh, in these in these uh, differences in these categories is at the point of young uh, young white versus young black males, right? In fact, our white our white undergraduates have way more respect for black grandmothers than they have for white grandmothers. Right? And so what you see again is sort of this focusing at this particular place, this particular age by sex place of, uh, of, of this particular uh, prejudice. Well, so the sex times age thing in my mind is starting to help us understand uh, some of the variability within an outgroup and why you'd have different threat, uh, 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 sort of threat and opportunity affordance values uh, 
that vary within our group, well, maybe that's largely sex and age. Now, now there are other kind of subtypes that don't differ by sex and age, and 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 uh, you may need other mechanisms. But I suspect that the most important ones actually have to do with uh, sex and age. Uh, well, does this mean that outgroups are an unimportant categorization? in the face of sex and age, and, and the answer is no. And the reason is, is because we still find that outgroup effect at that point. And the question is, why? Where is that coming from? So sex by age isn't, isn't, isn't capturing it. Outgroupness by itself isn't capturing it. Uh, well, sex times age gives us information, I'm arguing primarily about others' goals, which is useful for uh, assessing affordance value. Uh, we can't explain the outgroup effects or nuances. Actually, I just said this. We can't explain why young black men are seen by our white perceivers as more threatening than young white men, why young Asian men are not seen as more threatening. I haven't presented these data here. We've got a lot of different kinds of studies uh, that show that all these effects we're finding with white subjects looking at young black men, you don't, we don't find with young uh, Asian men. Even when these young Asian men, we put English expressions on their faces that might, that might uh, instigate perceptions of threat. We just don't quite get the same thing. And we still need to explain why uh, sometimes it turns out that people actually view outgroups more favorably than in-groups. And so if you look across studies of different sort of uh, beliefs about different ethnic groups and nationality groups around here, around, around the world, every once in a while, uh, you'll see that, uh, that, that Americans like Swedes better than they like Americans. They like Canadians better than them. So, every, so sometimes you see that there are that more positive affordances associated with outgroups than the in-group as well. And you need to explain that in some kind of way, too. OK. Uh, well. Sex by age tells us about goals, but maybe it tells us less about the strategies that people are going to use to pursue those goals. Uh, and we care more about the strategies, because the strategies are behaviors, and the behaviors are what confront us, and therefore impinge upon, uh, impinge upon our ability to pursue effectively the goals that we happen to have at the time. Uh, well, there are multiple strategies available for reaching pretty much any goal, uh, and so what would be useful to know is that what determines which strategies others actually select? What determines the strategies that people use? Because if you had, if you had a theory in mind about, uh, about the strategies that people are likely to use, then that's, that's very useful grounds for understanding being able to manage others', uh, others actions. Well, my, again, my, uh, my uh, novice reading of life history theory is that it's really about how physical and social ecology is constrained behavioral strategies. Now, if that's, if that's way off, you'll tell me later. Uh, uh, and so maybe it's, a, maybe it's a useful thing here. Okay. Well, if it's the strategies uh, that people use that define their affordance value and we want to predict those strategies, uh, it's useful to understanding, I would argue, the home ecologies of those we're interacting with. The home ecologies in which uh, people live their life primarily, in which they develop their strategies, uh, strategies that may in fact be, uh, become somewhat stable uh, for them, that those understanding the nature of the ecology uh, may tell us about the particular strategy. So the particular strategy that someone might use if they're interested in finding a mate, a particular strategy someone might use if they're interested in gaining status, given that there are multiple strategies that one could in fact pursue. So I'm presuming that people possess, <coughs> and this is where things are going to get really flaky, uh, something that we might call ecology prototypes. Uh, and that is an understanding of different ecologies out there, ecology maybe types, maybe think about it dimensionally, I'll come back to that, uh, that help us infer the threat opportunity profiles uh, of outgroups. Uh, these prototypes, like, like other kind of categories, would be triggered heuristically by specific cues, cues that someone is coming from a particular kind of ecology and should uh, constrain information in particular about how that ecology is constraining the use of some strategies versus others, leading to the selection of some strategies as opposed to, as opposed to others. All right, well, how do you characterize ecology prototypes? Uh, my first answer to this is, how do I, how do I know? Uh, my second uh, uh, approach to thinking about this is to think about what characteristics they ought to have. Uh, well, you know, whatever, whatever information exists in these prototypes should uh, possess features that actually do constrain, constrain strategy selection, that are perceived, have the ability to perceive this constraining strategy selection. So you can think about some things out there in the world that may actually influence people's strategies, but that kind of stuff would never be accessible to people's uh, perceptions because of the nature of the, of the, the structural circumstances or something like that, uh, and that they have cues associated with them that would now engage, engage those ecologies, those ecology prototypes. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present two 
very gross, uh, probably uh, uh, ill-informed types of prototypes. Uh, uh, ones that, uh, uh, well, think about something we're calling a desperation program. And notice I'm, I'm labeling these in terms of sort of psychology as opposed to in terms of the characteristics of the ecology itself, mostly because of my own uh, naivete about exactly how we think about labeling, but I think that would be an interesting thing to be thinking about. So a desperation prototype. Uh, a dominant ecological feature of uh, such a thing, maybe it can be one lives in, a, in, a, in an ecology where the resources are very scarce, their availability is very unpredictable, uh, and it's accessed or distributed unequally. So I'm, I'm stealing maybe some of the things that I talked with uh, you about earlier, and if I misrepresent you, I'm sure you'll let me know uh, <laughs> uh, later. Uh, so really, we're talking about sort of ease of uh, uh, ease of gaining uh, uh, important resources. Uh, what's the strategy uh, constraint of such environments? Uh, these kind of environments encourage uh, high risk, bold, uh, and present oriented kind of behaviors. Uh, uh, we can think about how that might get applied to a particular uh, kind of goal. So, for example, male status seeking of, of, of a particular sort of young male kind, kind of age. Uh, it may increase the likelihood that violent behavior is seen as a useful strategy or important, or maybe one of the ones that are available, left available to access uh, resources. Uh, it may be related to conspicuous display of, of, uh, of acquired goods. Uh, I'm trying to remember the label that you had for for that the dominant goods. Dominant goods, dominant goods, and uh, we'll play with that a little later. And the cues that one might use to make an inference about uh, about such an ecology, and uh, in particular the strategy, uh, might have things having to do with uh, sort of bold, uh, risky uh, uh, things like physical uh, sweat or uh, sort of uh, cold facial expression. Actually, when I was talking earlier to Matt about your sort of contempt point, contemptuousness. You know, this, this notion of someone, uh, uh, I don't know if that might be related to that at all. Uh, and in fact, the flaunting of broader social, uh, societal conventions, maybe in terms of dress, linguistics, and, and things of that sort. Bold kinds of things that, uh, uh, that are related to an orientation to grab stuff when you can because you don't know when you begin again and, and the like. Well, the affordance value for others, uh, uh, from folks maybe come from this, uh, from this particular uh, ecology, uh, might have to do with physical safety and property threats. Okay, let's think about the hopeful prototype, right? Sort of the opposite in some ways. So resources are sufficient, predictably available for the long term, and accessible, and maybe in fact are distributed according to effort, right? Different different kinds of different kind of uh, different kind of ecology there. This kind of ecology might encourage low risk, future oriented behaviors, investment maybe in one's own human capital. You've got time. Uh, you, you know that if you put effort in, you get paid off at the end, or at least you believe that. Uh, an application, again, for male status seeking uh, uh, might be uh, uh, an in increased likelihood that, uh, uh, that one, one might uh, do society-endorsed work, education, whatever, to access resources. Uh, it makes sense to avoid conflict under, the, under such circumstances. Cues might have to do with physical modesty, adoption of societal conventions, and the like. And the affordance value here being no physical safety or property threat, but maybe employment competition. Right? Now, it's no surprise, actually, that, that uh, when, I, when I was talking with my students about these kind of things, that, that they sort of generated these because what they were thinking about in mind is the, uh, is the prototype image that pops when, when, uh, when the typical Euro-American in this country thinks about young African-American men and young Asian-American men. They presume, in fact, if you ask them, uh, you know, where, where do these folks come from? What's their life like? The stereotype that pops is essentially also an ecology stereotype there as well. These are, these are two suggestions to more to give you I'm not sure how invested I am in these, but more to give you a sense of the kind of thing that I'm thinking may be useful uh, uh, to do if one wants to be able to explain the further texturing of, uh, of understanding uh, members of other groups and their affordance value. Why is it worth pursuing this kind of idea? Uh, well, we need to find a way to explain the nuanced beliefs people have about threats and opportunities posed by different out groups, right? We know that the different threats now drive all sorts of things that we've long been interested in, prejudices and behavior, but where do those threats come from? And maybe it's uh, uh, sort of going well. Uh, that thinking in terms of ecology prototypes may suggest a conceptually coherent approach to intervening uh, to reducing particular outgroup threat perceptions. And thus, so, for example, you can think about now the management of the prototype and the cues. Right? If you can manage certain kind of cues, you can imagine assumptions. So, what happens if you take 
the stereotypical image of a, of a young African American male, and all of a sudden you put a white shirt and a tie on the person. Or you take the Asian American male and uh, you start uh, doing uh, presenting kind of things that sort of look big like. And we've all seen sort of Asian kung fu movies and crime movies and stuff. And it's not very hard when you when you create but when you generate the cues that sort of seem to go with that kind of a similar kind of ecology, right? So the cues, so, so by, by placing folks, so what happens to uh, you know, uh, uh, new immigrants who come to a country who in fact tend to uh, live in those, in, in those more desperation kinds of uh, uh, environments, right? Uh, by virtue of being new and not having networks and not having money and the like, what are the, what are the impressions of them like? I suspect they're awful lot like the impressions that, uh, that the typical uh, Euro American student has of uh, young African American men. Uh, the other thing, reason why I think it's worth pursuing this kind of idea is that I like the idea of creating this vertical integration that brings us uh, from understanding about the ecologies in which people live to the nuances and how we process information about people every day. Right? I mean, and this, this is partially the reason why it's, I think it's so cool to be here uh, having these conversations with you because uh, instead of thinking that they're having one sort of discipline over here, sort of thinking about this kind of stuff in ecologies and not really thinking much about mechanisms and focusing on mechanisms, I think, I, I think, I think it, 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 we need to find some kind of integration. So I like the idea of doing this, whether it makes sense or not, I don't know. How to develop this idea? I don't know. These are, these are questions that I have very much clue on how to, clue on how to answer. Uh, but we might ask about what the social and physical characteristics of ecologies uh, actually satisfy those criteria that I talked about. And in fact, maybe there aren't so many. I mean, I don't know how many there are. There may not be so many. And how many prototypes actually are there? I mean, if you thought about it, I mean, a behavioral ecologist who thinks about other kind of, other kind of animals, how many, uh, how many different ecologies really are sort of functionally important for driving, for driving behavior? I mean, maybe it's really a limited uh, set. Does it make sense to think about ecologies in terms of types? Or maybe that there's some there's some dimensions that are just useful to be thinking about. How are they acquired? Are these ecologies just learned? Whole? Are there seed structures that exist in the mind that now sort of take uh, sort of culturally provided input to fill in some specific content? Uh, maybe we infer them by placing ourselves in a perspective taking kind of way uh, and thinking about how we would be under those circumstances. Uh, I have very little clue for this. Last last closing comments. Uh, I think it's very useful to think about person perception as affordance management. But again, I think it's useful to think about everything in terms of affordance management. Uh, it's really been effective for understanding the nuances of uh, intergroup uh, stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination, as well as social cognition more broadly. And, and actually, with Doug Kendrick and Mark Fowler and some of our students, we have a whole line of research that really looks at early stage cognitive processing and how these different fundamental motives alter the way we process complex social environments having to do with people of different ages and races and sexes and facial expressions and, and the like. Very sort of very new kind of findings that this kind of approach, affordance-based approach, is really valuable for. Uh, I think that our understanding uh, would be further enhanced by incorporating some of these ideas from life history theory, although I'm not sure I'm doing it right, and maybe I'm wrong. Uh, and, the, and the bottom line of what I, what I think would be sort of nice to have is to understand something about sex by age by ecology as it drives perceptions of threats which now drives uh, emotions driving, uh, driving our social behaviors. So thank you very much, and I appreciate any kind of help I can